We're, we're working on a movie called Black Film Now, where we're exploring the current state of African American film. So, um, from your perspective, how would you define black film? Well, uh, I would say, uh, <clears throat> you know, a film that's imagined and executed into the motion picture medium by an African descendant or African African American. Okay, so films about black folks that are directed by yeah. black folks don't count? Like A Color Purple, not a black film to you? Well, um, I mean, I would, for me, um, um, the director, that's in the end, you know, where it's translated into. In fact, that's, that film is lost in the director's lack of knowledge of the subject matter. So I would say it lost, I mean, it's a, a you know, it's a very uh, strong African-American literature, but its translation into cinema is completely um, uh, compromised by the fact that the filmmaker did not know the landscape that he was operating from. So I would say, uh, you know, to me, you know, a black film is like a Japanese film. A Japanese film is imagined, executed, and also intellectually owned by Japanese people. So to me, I think that's why there's a lot of uh, disputed territory that Africans continued in America, anywhere, continued to fight about these films that are catering the idea of white supremacy in, in not only in, in inception, but it's also in the kind of subserviency it will in the end do for white supremacy. Because uh, when you imagine a story that is not driven by black characters, uh, from a, a source of black imaginative origin, mm -hmm the war is lost and that's why there's a great deal of debate and discussion and continued for the past I mean from the time black people have made movies uh, especially by uh, movies that were done by main street mainstream cinema have been challenged by the black community as a legitimate cinema mm. and I understand it perfectly now you're you come out of sort of the L.A. film rebellion, but it's also sort of around the same time was the black arts movement. Um, can you speak to how the black arts movement helped influence some of your work? Well, you know, the black arts movement itself is um, a repercussion of the, uh, I would say, the war of independence by African people everywhere. So there was no black arts without the war of independence. Uh, the very fact that, <clears throat> you know, from the American uh, uh, black political movement, uh, from, you know, Du Bois, Garvey, you have to place it in that. And, and the African independence led by people like Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, etc. And so it's an ideological, uh, uh, culture that came about as a result of black people defining or struggling to define their own identity uh, by overthrowing the domination of white supremacy on the cultural sphere. Mm. And so black art, the black arts movement uh, without the early black jazz, without the early, uh, you know, even prison movement, liberation movement, all these things culminated into that period. Now, for me, uh, if you talk about the Black Arts Movement uh, and you are bringing about, uh, you know, Haki Madaburi, Baraka, Sonia Sanchez, uh, Tony Kate Bambara, you know, then they are part and parcel of that period that anyone who wanted to imagine an alternative planet and especially through the expressive mediums was operating from this movement of national 
uh, black identity struggle. Mm. Well, that's interesting to me. I mean, and from that came the black aesthetic? Well, of course, it's of always aesthetic. like that. Even the white aesthetic comes from the French Revolution, the American Revolution. So the revolutionary period, the upheaval of black, you know, uh, demand to, uh, to, you know, for autonomous, uh, uh, for autonomy, for uh, wanting to be in charge of their destiny, brings the cultural component with it because politics is not in the vacuum. Mm. Even armed struggle in Africa that was waged is not in the vacuum. Uh, and so even if you take Nat Turner, Denmark, Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, what do they, they unleashed the cultural literature of Frederick Douglass and etc. Mm -hmm. So it's inseparable relationship between politics and the, you know, the ideology of art. So take, take for example one of your early works, Bush Mama. You know, how, how, how does that speak to the time and the, need, the desire to make something uniquely black? It's a synthesis of, uh, in my, you know, my study of uh, Franz Fanon and George Jackson. Um, it, here again, it's the war of independence coming into my literature. Because Franz Fanon, you have to see him in the Algerian Liberation Front. Cabral comes in, George Jackson comes in, the African-American liberation struggle. And so this literature has a lot to do with my interest in doing Bushmama. Mm. You know, and so <clears throat> I think the, um, uh, the politics is, you know, without the cultural component is completely um, different kind of politics. The politics of like, for example, the politics and the art of deception is one part, one part of it. But when you talk about the kind of liberation struggle that is waged against white supremacy or the domination of white supremacist cultural you know, uh, dictatorship. When you declare war against that, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, Asia, in African Americans, in America, you unleash all kinds of art. Of course, the artist in American context is encouraged not to see herself or himself in the context of the struggle. But when you look at the struggle of society taking black artists into task mm -hmm. and debate and discussions uh, and even guilt of artists for uh, not living up to the expectation of their society shows you this reciprocal relationship of politics and uh, culture. So, I mean, in the whole history of film, are, are there works, I know in poetry it, it, there was black art, or there was a black aesthetic express. In theater there was. Do you think we've reached that ever in film? Or is it compromised by the nature of? The business part of it, yeah. Because, uh, you know, poetry, the medium of motion picture itself is business oriented. Finances in the picture more so now than ever before. If you look at white films of the early 1930, 20, 40, 50, 60, there were battles of ideas. The different directors, different political orientation, uh, they were navigating um, with capitalism. In fact, some of the most profound films to come out of America were very socialist influenced. Mm -hmm. It goes, it correlates to the political movement in America. Uh, and so uh, even Charlie Chaplin is considered by many as a left-wing or socialist filmmaker because he amplified the, you know, the ordinary people, the tramp, etc. So, um, but now more, more and more cinema is to, it's very difficult to, to, to bring about the uh, kind of story that is, uh, you know, that matters to social change, profit or money and box office, etc. But again, uh, it depends on the generation. The generation now uh, has no, is, 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 is a very confused generation as far as like independence and autonomy, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the, to have I mean, there's no space now, even however racist it was, there's no space 
for black artists in any field to bring about what jazz musicians achieved from King Oliver to Duke or whatever you want to take it for, you know. And so it's very difficult in motion picture to um, transaction the cultural psyche and identity of black people into motion picture because the ever, you know, the ever ending, uh, even silently, power of capitalism and profit continue to compromise in the field of imaginations. Uh, in other words, uh, young people are raped by capitalism to imagine. So like they're like surrogate uh, uh, people who I are impregnated by capitalism than let's say the, the right of their own imagination. That has now even uh, shifted. In, uh, in terms of like, uh, not many people really are fighting to defend their identity, the source of their imagination, wherever that imaginative art comes, they try to respond to society's uh, um, uh, idea of art, culture, art, from the time they found it. Meaning like, at the time of uh, the worst political climate in America, for example, versus, let's say, 1930, 1940, 50, the labor movement, etc. It's a different kind of the, the race issue, etc. Race versus class struggle. Even when we came in, the class struggle was real when we came in. Now, young people are born into the, the mutated power of capitalism as if it is something normal. And so for them, it has been more difficult than us even to negotiate the right of imagination to be pregnated by the very community they come from. So you can go anywhere and be impregnated by surrogate ideas of irrelevant um, subject matters because you are a filmmaker. So filmmaking becomes itself uh, an ego. Mm -hmm. in, in times like this, it's very difficult for young people to access their identity in motion picture. Well, you've been teaching young people for 30 years, right? That's where I got this point. I'm telling you. Okay. That's where I so, learned. So, I, you know, one thing that I've noticed is, is that, you know, we're, we're sort of in a, you know, quote-unquote post-racial America where, you know, uh, before blackness was defined by oppression, the black people were the people that weren't able to do certain things and out of that came a certain level of creativity. Now we have the freedom to do whatever we want and people don't want to be told that they're limited, that, that there's oppression, that, that there's racism. And I think that that's, that's causing sort of a, a schism. Well, then th there's no innovation involved because uh, when you find, in fact, that's why black people are making their, I mean, ordinary black people are making their own movie with their cell phone. They don't even care film to look for filmmakers anymore. So that's what, if you look at film and extend it to the way the black community, however imperfect, confronts police brutality with their cell phone, shows you the absence of the cadres of filmmakers who could have articulated it better by having the skill and craft and imagination Mm -hmm. uh, so the community is saying, you ain't my filmmaker. I'm making my own film because immediately now, housing, uh, police brutality is an immediate situation. And I'm, you know, uh, so in many ways, the uh, filmmakers are in New York and in, in LA, knocking at doors by the very um, prescriptions they think have to go through to make movies. But history is passing them too. So it's a, and again, I'm I'm not judging this generation. I just I, I'm glad I'm not part of this generation because it's very difficult. The the the, the oppressive you know the capitalist system has created a, a very um, uh, I would say subliminal relationship with the with the with the uh, you know with those who are who operate with imagination mm -hmm. it, it, to a point that uh, it, it automatically, its capacity uh, is so superpower mm -hmm. in the speed of light. It can sing your song, 
it, it, you, you, the minute you declare the black power anything, it joins you to black power it and diffuse it, you know? Uh, so black people, every time anything from rap to anything they come up with, it's already taken by Nike and Sony and, you know, it's become like commodified. And so, uh, you know, uh, Occupy movement, the, the system itself cross-dresses and joins you and, and marches with you. And so in a time like this, it's very difficult for young people to really create a very uh, uh, solid and somehow um, targeted struggle to transform the conditions of black people. Because the conditions of black people here in Africa, Brazil has not changed. So why, what's the importance of us being able to tell our own stories? It's a psychological, fundamentally, it's a ter like for example, it's like a form of exorcism because when human beings went into the cave, began to tell their story, they were uh, asserting their identity, who they are, putting themselves in a, in a time capsule of continuity uh, and therapeutically passing prayers, songs, healing uh, uh, psychological therapies. And so when you look at you know, tribal communal societies in Africa, uh, whether it's um, adorning the body, the clothes, or the, the, the yard, uh, or the mask, or anything Africans have always done, even including the music, has a lot to do with the transformation of the community, psychologically, spiritually. And so, uh, yes, when you don't tell your story, you'll be a confused human being forever. And that is what we are testifying now. We testify in Brazil, in, in you know, Jamaica, in Ethiopia, Ghana. We testify as a displaced people because we've lost the grip of our own story. And all human beings make stories to have a sense of continuity as human beings. The white power structure sustains its continuity. Uh, it's very greedy. It names the streets you walk on. It tells you who invented the street lights. It tells you who went to space and called it name with all Greek names of all the galaxies. Why, why, why? It has a mileage for white people. White power is a very uh, undeclared, silent, confident domination of the world in, in globalization terms. So they don't have to assert continually because we live, we live in their dictionary. We live in their vocabulary of white supremacy. Our desire is contaminated and held hostage by white supremacy. And so in a time like this, fighting to declare your own identity, your own story, therapeutizes you, gives you a sense of continuity, a human, where you've come from. Otherwise, you are a non-entity. Mm. And so stories are uh, a battle sounds, a battle cries. When you say, I want to tell my story, you're saying, I'm discontented. I am left out. I'm marginalized. Right. So we we've, we've seen waves of black filmmaking happen before in the 30s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and now now there seems to be a renaissance of black filmmaking, black storytelling. Um, you know, what what do you think defines this wave that's a little different from previous ones or is it all part of the same? Continuum in your mind. It's a you know it's a continuum of forward and backward. You know it's like uh, on 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 some aspect black people are going forward, on another aspect they're going backward. And so uh, in in film it becomes really insignificantly not that important. But in literature, for example, black people in music and literature have established. But the problem here now is now we're learning. Who owns the intellectual property of black imagination now is going to be a 21st century issue. Uh, jazz is great, but who owns it? Blues is great, but who owns it? And then if this is not capital, no wonder I can't make my own movies. Who owns the capital? If black people, if you harvest, if black people have produced so much cultural wealth in Leave sport out, just 
in jazz, in blues, in gospel, in American music that goes all over the world, how come they don't have a cent of that capital in order to extend and transform and transaction the future and the present imaginative process? How come they can't finance their own movie? As, why are they still poor? <laughs> if, to me, if I even only owned Billie Holiday's music, I would make 20,000 movies. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> so who owns the intellectual product of black people? Intellectual literature, even now, black publishers, for example, you talk about black arts, etc. The independent one published, financially they went out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only like three or four black publishers in literature. You know, Third World Press, Red Sea Press, uh, Black Classics. Right. Yeah. Who owns the writing and who reissues it? Why are most of the black uh, intellectual products and books out of print? Mm. So what should be the goal? Ownership, being independent, telling our stories, or infiltrating the system so that we can have more influence over the way we're perceived by the world? Well, I can't speak about infiltrating the system because I never met those who came back out of that, that dragon's mouth. So I would leave it to infiltrators. From slavery to now, we have known, in, including the African colonial history, infiltrators have gone, but they never came back. If they did, we would have some tangible uh, and formidable uh, position uh, to me. But, but in terms of black popular culture, you do see people like Kevin Hart, Will Packer, they've had a lot of success. Tyler Perry has had a lot of success. Um, you know, Ava DuVernay, she was in, they were talking about her directing the next Marvel film. You know, th these are great strides, you know, being, being able to make $100 million at the box office with, a, with black actors. And who owns it? You see, black people have always, especially, you see, what you have to be very careful is, it's a new plantation you're telling me. Black people have always produced uh, the largest uh, sugar in the planet. Black people have produced the largest cotton, if you include Africa and Brazil. Black people have produced, but did they own it? So I think, they, be careful now. There is a new plantation that has mutated to make us be confused. And I would not say, you know, people should not, you know, work wherever they work, etc. I always ask, then what? After you do this movie, where do you go and who can you determine your next movie? Otherwise, I just don't think there was economically formidable fallout from Sidney Poitier's infiltration. Mm. And line them up from then on all the way to now. Denzel Washington. Infiltration is equal to what? See, black people are good in emotional claiming of everything, including that, you know, Jesus was, you know, black. Mm -hmm. Well, let's quantify these claims. As far, as far as I'm concerned, I will shut up if you show me a quantification. And I would work for a black capitalist to make my next movie. Mm. I want a black capitalist who is not going to railroad me to the plantation system. Mm. And so that's, I think. The other thing is, you know, you were mentioning young people. I think they have to do, I'm just saying I could be proven wrong. And the young people have to prove me wrong mm -hmm. if they could do that. But I would say it's very important for them to know we've heard uh, from Sydney and before Sydney black folks who advance their individual uh, vertical mobility in the industry and still came out of it poorer, like, you know, Jackie Wilson in music. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, that, like, no one could sing like this brother <laughs> ever. <laughs> he was mm -hmm. one and the only one. But who owns his voice? Mm. See, this is, to me, critical. 
uh, I have intellectual properties, and I'm, I'm telling you, as I get older, I'm talking about who owns it. Am I going to give it up now mm -hmm. after I suffered this many years to uh, produce them? Am I going to give it to white plantation owners who do not have any, have any accountability to my history, to my story? This is the issue. And so uh, for me, I would leave it. I think Ava, you know, Ava since you brought her name, I think she's a, an amazing strategist. I'm studying her moves to see you know, she's cooking, unlike many people I know. I mean, uh, I don't know Tyler Perry. I don't know none of everybody, you know, most of the people you mentioned. But with her, I'm waiting to see um, her, her, you know, this skillful strategy. Um, and it's, uh, uh, you know, survivalist mechanism. Mm. In or out. <laughs> and I'm not sure she, she's too smart. I don't think she, I think she knows from what I'm gathering a little bit of by her. I don't know her very well, but I think she's smart. I don't think she would uh, put all her eggs in Hollywood like many black people who did and became now completely uh, humiliatingly beggars. Mm. And that's a lesson for her and any, all the other young people. And so for me, it's not a big deal. We've known, we've known rich black people. Uh, in Chicago, there was a, one of the, in fact, I always wanted to make a film on this man who was one of the biggest, f richest black men on earth. And when depression hit, he was the first to go to jail mm -hmm. and ended up as a doorman to all the people he exploited in slum dwelling relationship. And so we've known mm -hmm. rivers, we've known claims. So, so, so you, no one gets out alive. No one, if you're black, it's yeah. Hard to, I mean, it's hard to leave here. Let me tell money. you, my brother. Where's the black? Where's the black bank that we knew existed at a certain time? Where's you know? Where's the black capital? So, is that the biggest issue? Is it is it fi financing the films, or is it getting audiences to go support films? Well, to me, I, I think audiences is not. Uh, to me, black people, if you make a credible, honest effort in making, responding your true feeling, however imperfect that is, black people will embrace you. We proved it with Sankofa. Black people will embrace you. Without big publicity, without anything, they will embrace, embrace you. The problem here is, I don't think they have delegated us to compromise them in boardrooms and tell, you know, change their stories by creating all this things that white filmmakers or white artists do not have. White artists don't have the pressure of living up to like saying, oh, we have to have 10 black people in the story. There should be, we're shooting in DC, it can't be all white. They don't, they just make movies. I think black people, you know, always go in a room and are told it has to be streamlined. Even you take Selma, I mean, uh, if I did Selma, the LBJ will not be in the story. And they were like, and she was good enough to let them have LBJ in the film. Mm. Uh, she, uh, she inherited the script, it came with it. But I'll tell you, they should be grateful he is in the story because he does not deserve to be in the story. Mm. Okay? So they don't get, you know, they don't get satisfied. They get greedy and gave the sister hell. Okay? They should be uh, happy and grateful for letting LBJ be part. No, there were more other stories that could be told instead of the time he occupied in the screen time. Yeah, well, that was a big, that was a big controversy, and some people feel like it cost them some nominations. The the fact that there was some backlash that LBJ was was represented, sort of, they felt unfairly in the film. Well, I, I don't think. I, I don't. I don't think. I. I, I think you know. To me, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, the project uh, was snatched from you know from uh, white power structure, and it cannot be forgiven. You know, it's a film that has moments that are unforgettable. Unforgettable on, on especially Martin Luther King's as a human being. Uh, it's a film I appreciated because it, it made Martin Luther King a human being instead of a myth. I'm very grateful for her for doing that film. But at the same time, uh, LBJ should not have been in the film. Mm. Well, let's talk about your film. Which one? 
The one you're about to do. Oh, I forgot about that one. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. You're ready to go out? Where you're gonna go out? To, you you said you did the scouting and stuff already, right? I did, but then it's, it got interrupted. The, the script has, had been written last September. Uh, I should have shot. Now it should have been finished, edited. Mm. Mm. And what what was the hold up to? Well, there's folks who who gave. A decent money, the European Union took back their money, and uh, my co-producer was ill, and they took the money back saying, you know, we don't trust the African filmmakers will manage, although the, the money, by all proclamation, was given to the film. Mm. But that's, no, that's neither there nor here. So we're, we're here, we're using technology to help get the word out, to help raise money, and allow you to independently make the film that you want without compromise well when I'm begging I'm compromising my brother <laughs> so the whole the whole thing is uh, you know it shows you know I started my life with you know crowd fundraising I'm still crowd fundraising I'm not proud of that uh, I should have I should have I think that for the kind of uh, exhibition and distribution my films have the kind of price they got I should have had some decent f not big money decent finance to just do films instead of again taking another year to find money well I'm just curious why what do you think happened was was the world not ready for it or w what were the factors that kept like Sankofa was a huge success mm -hmm. you know why weren't there more opportunities immediately following to make well, films? Well, it was a huge success by black uh, uh, population. Black people put Sankofa on the map of the world, but they don't own no banks. Mm. You have to know that. To me, black people can embrace a movie. And they did amazing work for us. The Sankova family across the United States helped us distribute the film. And so, for me, black people, they could love you like hell. They hugged me like hell, millions of them. But it doesn't translate to black capital or black financing infrastructure. Because regardless of the success of Sankofa, we still are a community that economically is not empowered. Mm. Okay, so yes, black people could, you know, black people uh, could, you know, could vote for you, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not decisive economically mm -hmm. because no uh, independent black banking system or any, in, you know, economic infrastructure to say, to finance uncompromisingly all intellectual expressions of black people. Mm. What a freedom to have. For the first time, we need a planet to say, sister, just give birth of a story you want to tell. Brother, just give birth of a story you want to tell. That is a white luxury, not a black luxury. Right. So. And sorry to depress you. But to me, until you create the economic infrastructure that is also interested in multiplying and transforming okay, mm -hmm. the cultural uh, expressions of black people, it remains mortgaged. Mm -hmm. And when your imagination is mortgaged, when your imagination is mortgaged, the story of a people is compromised. Because you have to know the artist doesn't want to compromise to the very community. Mm -hmm. But it's not even the issue. The artist is expected to compromise to white demands, to transplant white characters that never were. You know, for my mother to exist, she has to drive Miss Daisy. That is a complete racist arrangement, but we allow it to this day. Everywhere I go, there's a Driving Miss Daisy play going on, if not a movie. 
And most servant movies are made to drive Miss Daisy one way or another. Why is that? It's because of the po white power over black subject matter. Well, I think Melvin Van Peebles, he, he once told me, uh, he, uh, Hollywood lists by the golden rule. He who makes the gold rules. So if they're paying for it, they want to see themselves reflected in, in the movie. But the, I don't know if you've seen these recent films uh, like 42 and The Butler and The Help. You know, they were, they were all made over $100 million. And they all sort of had a perspective that racism is something that America tackled in the 60s. Fine. It's not my problem. I, I, uh, I don't see these movies. One, they don't bother me. I create a space, as you see here. This is my place. This is my liberated territory. Thanks to those who went to Sankofa to see. They gave me an editing space. I'm grateful. So it's not my problem. See, it's very bad to compare. You know, because it's like saying um, to a, a slave that wants to, uh, an enslaved African to run away, planning to run away, telling him about the uh, black folks in the big house mm -hmm. have infiltrated a good life. So why escape? It don't make no sense. So for me, um, they, they're not my modality. In fact, I have... I would say I have white filmmakers I respect more than just a black filmmaker. I'm not a nationalist blind. Mm -hmm. In fact, I believe in this you know, class stratification. Uh, the only contemporary movie I've seen is Selma. Mm -hmm. uh, outside that, I do not care. I'm not compelled to get in my car and go see a movie. I've seen some in a jury, international jury, and they don't grab me because I can tell from the writing from the way it's concocted the hands of uh, the white power structure white supremacy or the culpritness of the black filmmaker in bringing about white power in his or her imagination they don't mean nothing to me and nor would I see them as adversary or fight. I rarely talk, I mean, I don't even think about them because the preoccupation itself would, would, would have to be from a problem. I don't have no problem. I, I don't have a problem with a, a, a very contented black person in this planet. I'm discontented. Mm -hmm. Irresistibly discontented black people are attractive to me. Okay. <laughs> so we... So you, you, what is, is it catharsis through your art? No. Like, or or no. You, you observe, at your, at this, your stage you can observe this, know what's going on and still find other things. I focus do. because I think those, you know, black folks who should be busy about inventing with whatever humble uh, resource they have should concentrate on that and not be diverted because one of the techniques of white supremacy is always trickling, um, cadres of um, uh, their own ideological soldiers impersonating uh, your interest. To be diverted is equally a problem for me. I don't care for those black people who are preoccupied to argue every time Hollywood makes a black film. I don't go for that. Mm -hmm. I think that energy should be spent productively. Even if only you paint one frame of your grandmother, that's more power than debating for hours on precious or something. To me, it's irrelevant. I don't join it. It's not my type uh, or my way of, uh, that is diversionary. Mm -hmm. And the system f feeds that and lives off of that. So what, what's the goal? What, 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 what's your mission statement? To make my movie, to make my story, tell my story without thinking all this diversionary things that hijack your, you know, your, your, your power or right of imagination. Defending my imagination is key for me, is important from day one. Once I moved into motion picture, I said from here on, I defend my ideas. I defend my stories. I'm as greedy about my story as white people are, period. And that's normal. And most white people say, yeah, that's correct. So let's circle back. That's, that's a good note to carry on about this, next, this new film. Yeah, Yetutlijino is a film, you know, it's about um, a domestic servant 
um, the principal character and a love affair with an ordinary um, uh, character. And uh, what interests me about is her how her life is locally dominated and globally dominated in the American empire. So I'm fascinated by her story because her want to love is not affordable locally by the local power structure. So if you then, even if she escapes the local power structure over her, mm -hmm. she enters the global power of the American empire that began in the Second World War. So I want to make a film about you know, even love is headquartered by this empire and arrangement locally and globally. Mm. And what, Simple. what led you to go to Indiegogo as a platform? Young people like this woman here, they're always saying, you know, you're missing out, brother. You got to get in here. I'm really a railroaded traveler and I'm studying it. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll tell you this. I don't do outside interviews and things. I don't do nothing. I don't even lift a finger. All I'm doing is editing a documentary film downstairs and they're enslaving. A lot of people who want to help me are enslaving day and night. I'm not lifting a finger because uh, for me, doing this film, finishing a film before class starts is my preoccupation. That's the real, tangible. I grabbed the film, it's about the Ethiopian-Italian war, my ancestors, my father fought the Italians. I want black people to see how black people don't apologize when they go to war with white people. And so I want to make that movie, it's tangible. This one, if it happens, is going to empower me. I'll be very grateful to all these people who would help me. But until it materializes, you don't live on that. You live in concrete things. Even if you only do a humble, small film, do that. Mm -hmm. So, but Julie Dash, she did a Kickstarter. Spike Lee did, did the Kickstarter. Um, you know, there seems to be a trend in, in terms of this. Well, well I, they, didn't, they didn't influence me because <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I didn't even know the uh, me mechanics of it until a few weeks ago some young people just said, you know, wake up, get into this thing, let's help you. So I don't know, if they went, they didn't send me no blueprint or experiential anything, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm, you know, I am in it now, and I'll tell my other friends if it succeeds, I want to pull Charles Burnett, Larry Clark, you know, Ben Caldwell, and then say to them, hey, folks, Billy, this thing works. And I will be a good, uh, what you would call, a, I will be the missionary for the cause of uh, crowd fundraising. And it's real. I think it's powerful. I think the idea is powerful. I just don't know what kind of network and power we have to really make it also our own. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not clear. I'm always suspicious. I was, I, I'm, I'm a man uh, who was born in the middle of wars, wars where my body and story is uh, underneath. I had to find it in the rubbles of white power structure, white supremacy. So for me, 24 hours war is being suspicious of everything, including the technology. Every camera, I don't just embrace. You know, I was telling Brad the other day, I, I, you know, a lot of people mis misunderstand. I'm, I don't love film. I hate film because it was used against me. It was used against my psyche. It was used against my people. So I'm not like uh, this blind, oh, film, I'll kill to do film. No, I'm suspicious of cinema. It has destroyed Native Americans, so many Latin Americans, their history destroyed by this hundred years history of this weapon. In fact, Latin Americans call it the new hydrogen bomb. So why would I love cinema? I never, from day one, I was not. I look like I love film when I talk shots and film grammar and my students to make them work hard. I sound like I love film, but I'm, it's a mis misinformation I'm giving out. Was there a film that you saw in your developing years that made you say, aha, I, got, I have to make film? Yeah, uh, The Power of Cinema, Usman Samben, you know, his film Black Girl, Boram Sarat, opened my eyes 
uh, Latin American films, The Hour of the Furnace by Solanas, you know, The Blood of the Condor by Sanjinas from Bolivia, uh, Miguel uh, Litin, The Jackal, my brother, Latin America, even American filmmakers that are going around not paying tribute were influenced by Cuban films like Memories of Underdevelopment. So when I was at UCLA, these are the movies that I was attracted to when I saw the power of the cinema. And let's touch on that and maybe two more points and then we'll be done. Um, so that, the era, that era, it's known as the LA Rebellion. Um, you know, when I've had a chance, the, the relics of that was, were recently toured around the country and I got a chance to see in one you know, big month at International House all of this amazing work that uh, seemed to be about black people but done completely outside of any kind of system or studio system. Um, what, you know, from your perspective, what, what was that time period, what was that movement about? No, you know, the part I was in was actually not a single black nationalist movement. It was, it was a group of black and non-black people who went to school at UCLA, uh, who were intellectuals in the environment in that area, who were debating um, class versus race. So I'm not part of that. This LA rebellion is not a black thing. It is a multicultural, especially Chicanos, Asian students whose father was whose fathers were doing gardening to those Hollywood people, Native Americans. Okay, and I dare to say some white folks, and we were studying. You know, that's the, <laughs> Richard Wright. George Jackson, again, Richard Wright, The American Hunger. He split with the Communist Party, it was very important for us. Langston Hughes, Good Morning Revolution, is what we read in poetry. So, I mean, there is a black ideology because uh, black people, especially Fanon, um, M.E. Césaire, uh, and Nkrumah, etc., the Pan African movement was very left wing to begin with. So it's not just, I, I, I'm not a soldier of the black bourgeoisie. I'm not, I will never be a soldier of the black bourgeoisie because it's a pepper tiger, it's irrelevant, it doesn't have co coherent cultural program, you know? Mm -hmm. Black people with money, I say, well, after you die, your kids go to war in, in court systems, etc. But what use is it? What pyramid did you build with it? So modern black capitalists mean nothing to me. They don't leave no pyramid, no monuments, no, no movies that should have been produced by them. I would have been, I would have been the first slave to enter a black bourgeoisie owned a black film industry. I would work for him or her. So for me, this waving to me all these rich black people means nothing because they never leave when they die they never leave one small pyramid we only know they were the first black rich people so what big deal i would say mm. you accumulated money but what pyramid did you build this is where white capitalism you know comes to profile its power because the white capitalist knows culturally he or she has to live, immor become immortal. Mm -hmm. Not by the money, by the culture he or she subsidized. subsidized. Mm -hmm. you know, Rockefeller is not by the money, it's what they, the monuments they build to keep their names going. And so for me, uh, the, I, I'm not like that. So the LA Rebellion thing is a very contented, contested issue. It is ideological. It is not every black nationalist who is a member of the LA Rebellion. Or else, if there was a rebellion, it is a multicultural. I don't want to betray Native Americans who, who were there and they, in their silence gaze at this racist cinema industry. I learned a lot. Mm. When they want to dare make a film, I learned a lot. I felt a, a member of that community because I too craved for my story. 
Well, how could that? Ha how does it happen at UCLA and not USC or any other school? Well, there, uh, there was a brother, uh, Alicia Taylor, I think, who was forgotten, who started to bring these films. I'm telling you, he was a teacher there. He was undermined, fired even, but he, when briefly he was there, he he brought black students, Chicanos there. Alicia Taylor mm. created bringing African filmmakers like Usman Samben to UCLA, Latin American filmmakers to UCLA. So p politically, you know, Angela Davis was around, so George Jackson is around. All these are environmental things declaring against capitalism because capitalism shortchanged us, compromised us, only exploited our history. Mm. And so we had that phobia already. Uh, but for me, LA Rebellion is ideological and multicultural and multiracial. So in terms of the pyramids that you're leaving behind, what, how do you see your legacy so, thus far? Imperfect. I did, I did my best. I'm proud of all the films I have made because never did I make any one of my films having a silent power in my head telling me what film, what story to tell. Every story I did, I'm driven by it. I'm driven by it from internal. They existed, they became, in spite of the cliché discussion. For example, when I did Sankofa Aile, doing slavery movie, that's the end of you. Slavery is not, that's the last thing to touch. No, it comes, I pick, and then it became a vocabulary. Sankofa is now part of the words of things. I'm proud of that. My film is imperfect, but the movement is powerful. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So Bush Mama, I made that film. I imagined it. I gave birth of it. And thanks to the camera people, the actresses that gave me free labor and collaborated in shaping it to be a you know, filmmaker of intensity. But it's an imperfect film. Ashes and Embers, the same way. Mm -hmm. All my films are imperfect, but they have one driver obsessed, unrelentingly uncompromising, and that's highly. I don't compromise. Are my films the greatest? No. If they are, if black people embrace them, it's because they didn't compromise them. Because black people know when a movie opens, they know it's against them. Com they are being compromised. Well, in the opening credit, they'll tell you. Even when we came to the theater, like in Baltimore, when black folks heard we produced it, they could not believe it. And they would go applauding and putting money and leaving money to us because they do not want to be silently mortgaged by nice do-gooder white people who would make film for them now and then. And then black people are asked to be grateful by a white, the white woman who did Imitation of Life, who wrote Imitation of Life. She called Sterling Brown when he criticized the film and she said, you people are ungrateful. I give you a chance to be in a movie. That's how they think down there. Well, that, that was an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Usher didn't buy She's Gotta Have It. And you know, you had Sidewalk Stories and Sankofa and Daughters of the Dust, Hollywood Shuffle. There were a lot of independent films being made at that time the, by black people, directed by black people, that, that it was just an exciting time. Um, I don't think it was an exciting time. No? For you it is, looking at it now. Mm -hmm. It's a, a hard labor time. It's a very, very difficult time. Mm. You know, the films, uh, you know, don't, don't be deceived by their look and th their claim. Even what I'm saying now it was very difficult to find, to finish, you know, how long it took Charlie to finish to sleep with anger. Mm. You know, the difficult, I'm sure, jo you know, I don't, I know very little, Daughters of the Dust, very difficult. But the Spike thing is another planet, meaning they come after this movement has established itself in New York, LA, wherever where they were being made. Spike uh, is buttressed by these things that happen as he was coming in. Uh, Ernie Dick Dickerson, who shot for him, uh, I used to show him this LA films here as a student at Howard. Um, I even feel More Better Blues is indebted to Larry Clark's film Passing Through because Passing Through was the first film that put the idea of jazz 
in colorful African-American cinematic accent for the first time. The whole, I'm not saying that, that film established an amazing, and I knew, and I showed Ernie that film a lot. And I'm sure La, you know, um, Spike Lee had seen them. I, I saw him when he was a student at Clark, I, where I showed Child of Resistance. We had brief encounter. Mm -hmm. I remember him very well, because he's a very insistent person. He used to come to Howard also. So they have to know this, this had impacted on them. But not only this, Sam Ben Usman has played a major role in influencing African-American cinema. Because mm -hmm. here's a, an African man in Africa making his own movie in his own language. That is now, you know, there, when I first saw his film, the fact Africans spoke their own language, not English, not French, not a, that was like a heart attack case for mm -hmm. me. I was grateful and I said, damn, does it mean my characters can speak their own language? And that's how Harvest was made. So last thing, um, for people watching who are, one, who are inspired after hearing you speak and want to make films that challenge the cultural norms, you know, what, what words of advice, what, what, is, what well, can you say to them? First, I have to charge them. They have to pay, go to the Indiegogo for your tutelage, okay, child of, pay, and then I will advise after that. And my advice after you go to in, Indiegogo, she's going to kill me if I don't, child of, if I don't do child of. You see her laptop? So if you don't do that, she's going to kill me. And so I would say, you know, one, you know, uh, one, ex first, understand clearly the historical circumstances of the time and place you live. Don't think yourself egotistically as God. When you think of yourself God, you compromise your principles because there is no such a thing. For me, look at the time and place you live. Stories are critical and important and therapeutic. But prepare yourself. Storytellers cannot outlandishly Flippantly make a story of a people and make sense. Respect your people, respect yourself, respect where you come from, respect the past, whatever people attempted to do without you judging it in your own time and capsule. And then study a great deal. Not only your own cultural uh, outputs of African descendants from here, Africa, Brazil, but also the world. Read Russian literature. Go into some Chinese novels, translated, of course, if you don't speak Chinese. Go to uh, writers in Europe, Latin America. Read Open Veins to Latin America. Galliano is one of the most powerful writers. Read. Read George Jackson. Don't underestimate just because a black man or a woman is in prison. Read Angela Davis. All the time study. And don't say, uh, until I study, I'll not make a movie. I'm not saying that. Study concurrently as you tell your story. Grow. Be willing to grow. And then the final thing is, respect people walking to see your film. Respect each one and every one of them. If they walked, left, they could go to a bar, they could go to a date, they could go many places. They came to a room to see your film, whether 5, 10, 100. Respect them first. Don't be arrogant filmmaker because filmmaking is a fascist preoccupation. You walk all over people. You exploit women. You screw everybody because the movie is your right of uh, fascist. Your right of being fascist. Don't be part of that. Fight the decadent culture of filmmaking as it comes down to us from Hollywood, spearheaded by Hollywood. It's not a big deal to be a filmmaker. You cannot be forgiven uh, just because you're a filmmaker to walk all over people. And that to me is how you prepare. And this is nothing. I mean, I'm not saying nothing uh, new, but this is saying respect yourself, respect the people who come to see. Be grateful they came to see your film. And hear them out because your next film is going to grow and be better from listening to them. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I had asked Bradford, do you think um, real, true black cinema can exist within the Hollywood system? No. 
there's no there's no truly really truly white cinema now anymore in the way we know white cinema like citizen kane or you know even john ford however racist he was even white film has become a clone it has become plastic it's become the human the human part of white story even you know the 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 literature like uh, faulkner and all those guys, you know, the American greats, grace, grapes of wrath cannot be made now. Hmm. Taking its time, you know, for Henry Fonda to just do his monologue. Now he has to sell his chest, if not a Coke, if not a jacket, if not a fashion. So even white films are in trouble. Forget black people and Native Americans, etc. White films are in trouble. Why, you know, white cinema is in its decadent era. It's living in, it's mutated to be stupid. Some of the best white filmmakers don't even make movies anymore. They make wine <laughs> or make spaghetti. They, they stop because they say, I'm, I can't be silly and stupid. And most of them will tell you the films they made in the 1960s, 70, 80 cannot be made now because this doggy doggy industry has become a garbage disposal. So what you see is white garbage decorated by black garbage, okay? Now Hispanic and Asian garbage, mix all that. It's supposed to be multicultural um, gratification. No, it's capitalism concocting its own gumbo to, to still live more years exploiting people. That's crazy. All right. uh, Thanks.